This is Jeffrey Wong. You're listening to Interview with the Surgeon with the Surgeon Agent. On this episode of Interview with the Surgeon, we welcome Dr. Jeffrey Wong, co-director of USC Spine Center and a recognized expert in the surgical treatment of all neck and back disorders. As a world-renowned leader in spine care, Dr. Wong is continuously writing and presenting professional articles, publications, and speaking engagements to national and international audiences. He assumes numerous leadership roles in nationally respected medical organizations, including serving as president of the North American Spine Society, Cervical Spine Research Society, and Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics. His research interests include gene therapy for the treatment of spinal disorders, minimally invasive surgery for spinal disorders, bone growth biological proteins, and biomedical engineering of non-invasive spine surgery using high-intensity focused ultrasonic waves. Dr. Wang has received numerous research grants and is currently involved in many clinical trials in the treatment of spine problems. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. We are featuring Dr. Jeffrey Wong. Dr. Wong, how are you doing today? I'm doing Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thank you for being with us today. So let's just jump right into it. You know, let's kind of look back and if you can kind of help us understand what were your goals and aspirations during your residency and how did those change throughout your fellowship? Sure, sure. Um, you know, that's, that's a great question because when I think back, I think during my residency, I, I had more short-term goals because I, I really just wanted to learn as much as possible. So I, I was a student, um, my mind was a sponge and I was just soaking up all this information and I, got, I went into orthopedics. So I was just trying to get as much information as possible. And I think my short-term goals were whatever I was doing at the time, I wanted to learn as much and try to be the best I could be at that specific topic. And obviously through residency, you go through all these different topics. And so that, that changes all the time. Um, as I progressed later in my residency, I started to focus on spine and spine surgery. And that's where I started to have more longer-term goals where even though I was still in a residency and learning all the different aspects of orthopedic surgery, I, I, saw, I thought about how this applies to a future career in spine. Um, for example, if I was dealing with a shoulder and elbow, how, how can that mimic spinal disorders? And uh, what, what are the types of patients that are like athletes? You know, how, how do we apply the spinal treatments to them as opposed to some little old ladies who have spine problems, you know, completely different type of patient. And so I, I would say that um, I think my, my my mentality changed into more longer term goals as I, as I morphed towards spine and as I went into my fellowship. Sure, and with that same mindset, you know, what was the mentality when you were going in your fellowship, you were looking for your first job, and how did that perspective change in the beginning years of your early career? Yeah, you know, um, it, it's interesting. Um, I, I think I learned from watching other people, and the thing that amazed me when I was looking at jobs is how people's perspectives changed. Uh, I would see people that were before me take jobs and say, these are the greatest jobs in the world. And then a year or two later, change jobs. And, and I, I thought to myself, like, why, why, what changed? And, and could, you have, could you have anticipated these changes? And so the, I think the biggest thing that I learned when I was looking for my jobs is understanding that I would change and that my perspectives would change. And so I tried to be honest with myself on what I wanted and what my goals were uh, to allow me to, to pick the best job opportunity for me, which I think everyone does. But I think the little extra kick that I had is that I anticipated that I would change things. And so I, when I looked at any aspect, I said, well, what if this would change? What if this would change? And maybe I arranged my first job situation, which lasted quite some time, uh, because I tried to anticipate all those changes. And, and perhaps um, the people that change jobs maybe more frequently uh, maybe they're just not anticipating those uh, changes. And, and you have to be honest with yourself because it's not just external changes. I, I mean, you can't control like the external changes, how things may change with other people, your partners, or maybe the economy. But what you can change is you. Like, how are, how are you going to view this? If something, if a hardship comes up or some barrier comes up, are you going to let it just sort of eat at you and, and cause some resentment? Or are you just going to go beyond that? So you, you have to understand, anticipate changes within yourself. Now, when you were getting started, were you strictly focused on the academic route or did you ever consider going to private practice? So uh, I, I realized the world was oyster, but, but I wanted to kind of be honest with what I wanted. And, and so I, I always wanted a career in academics. Um, I think all of us in, in that situation, when you're picking a job, you're in academics and you're, you're just finishing your training. And so private practice is this sort of unknown world. Because even though you, you, you talk to people, you have friends and colleagues who are in private practice, 
because you just finished your training, your entirety of your training has been within an academic facility. And, and so you have to be honest with yourself and you get an idea whether or not you like that or not. And I, I really enjoyed it. I, I enjoyed the research. I enjoyed being in touch with the younger surgeons and teaching and, and being in an academic environment, which, which I feel like never goes stale. Um, I, I, I talked to some people in private practice and a lot of them were just kind of focused on their own practice. And it just seemed like their world was a little bit smaller than, than if in academics. And, and also I knew that that appealed to me. So now that you're at the top of your game in your respected specialty, what would you say were the keys to your success as you went out through your career to get to where you are today? Well, um, I, I think there's a few things that I kind of look back on. Number one is um, always build value in yourself. Um, you, you know, there are things that I did. I, I didn't quite understand while I was doing it. I just, maybe the understanding was, this is gonna make me better. This is going to give me a skill. Um, taking extra time to do something. Um, you might sit there and, and other people may view it as like, why are you doing that? Why are you taking that course? Why are you um, volunteering for that? Why are you doing this administration work? You don't get money for that. It, it, so the return isn't as tangible. Uh, but for me, it's like, well, I, I saw it was build, building value in myself. I said, well, if I do this, I'm going to learn a little bit about this. If I volunteer for this, I'll get a little bit of perspective from the patients or, or from the payers or from the insurance. Um, I volunteered for a lot of things um, within our department. And uh, with my first position, when I went back to my first um, place where I trained, I became vice chairman. And I'll tell you, um, it was very satisfying for me uh, working within the department and, and being on the administrative side in addition to the clinical side. And for me, it just, it just felt like I was building value in myself. I think the second thing and probably the most important thing is you always think globally. And, and what I mean by that is, is that... Um, I feel like I listen to other people's point of view. Uh, when, when a situation arises, whether it's a crisis or some type of dilemma, I, I don't just look at my point of view. I kind of look at how the department, my colleagues, my partners, how they're going to look at it. I look at it maybe for all the surgeons, not just within orthopedics and not just uh, in spine, but other surgeons. But then take the extra step. Look at the other side of the coin. Look, look at how do the people with opposite points of view look at how's the administration look at it. How's the insurance company look at it? And, and I think it makes you a little bit more well-balanced. Um, and and there, there are some things that I, I think it, maybe you can tolerate things a little bit better. You know, if someone imposes a, a new restriction or rule, instead of just reacting to it and just taking a negative viewpoint, understand globally where they're coming from. And even if you can't change it, and even if you don't like it, having some understanding of why they implemented it maybe makes it a little bit more palatable and a little bit more accepting. And so I, I've really found, and I, I always tell my residents and fellows, try to think globally. Uh, think about all the different points of view. It just makes you a better person. I absolutely agree with that. That's great. And kind of on that topic, when you're dealing with fellows and residents, um, I also know that you're also involved as a president on some, some pretty strong organizations and societies. You know, what advice are you giving to these chief residents or even starting out residents and fellows as to how to go about the job search process for the first time because that, that real transition from going from a student to a job seeking professional seems to really be a struggle for a lot of them. Yeah, it, it is a struggle and it's all new territory. Um, I think that the, the most important thing is to be honest with yourself. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys that sit there and they're geographically, they want to go back to a place that's very favorable geographically. Um, you know, I'm in Southern California. There's a lot of people that want to come back to Southern California. And there's a lot of people that they put that as their top priority and they say, well, I, I just want to be in the location. I'll be happy. My family will be happy. And maybe you'll accept, you know, maybe a more junior position. Maybe you'll expect, accept a little bit less salary in order to be here. And, and so um, there's a lot of concessions that people will make and they'll say, it's okay. What they don't understand is that six months later, when they have the job and they're in this position, they may still look at it and say, well, why am I not making as much as the other people? Why am I not in the same house that other people have? Why am I taking more call than other people? And that's what we were talking about early. Their perspective has changed. And try to anticipate that. Um, sometimes people are so focused. They have the top three priorities. It's geography. Maybe it's the amount of money they make. And maybe it's um, the types of patients they'll see. And they're willing to accept all the rest. The problem is, is that six months into that, into that job, the things that you thought weren't going to bother you, they're starting to bother you. 
And so the, the, the best advice I have is understand that your perspective is going to change and see if right now you can sit, sit there and anticipate some of those changes because your perspective will change. Uh, that's really wonderful. And also think about now with, with the COVID situation, kind of a lot of things have moved to Zoom. I know a lot of the national annual meetings have been virtual. What advice do you have for the residents and fellows that are still wanting to network but are not having the platforms of the conferences to be able to meet folks like yourself? Yeah, you know, I think that's something we still have to work out um, because no one knows where that's going. But absolutely, there's going to be a virtual component to almost every meeting. Even if we get back to face-to-face -face meetings and they become kind of back to normal as far as the regularity, I, I think most of them are going to offer some type of virtual component. Um, my, my advice is jump on the bandwagon, like right now. Um, the, the, when I look back on my career, uh, the things that kind of held our department back or individuals back is when they, did, they weren't accepting of change. And so I think this is a great opportunity. You know, um, before COVID came, a lot of us didn't want to deal with telemedicine. We wanted to continue to see our patients face to face. There's a lot of value in doing that. We we're forced to do it with the COVID. And now we realized, hey, you know, patients are liking this. Uh, there's a lot of patients that don't want to drive in and pay the parking fee and spend two hours in traffic each way. Um, and so there are benefits from it. So become an early adopter. Um, try to anticipate that and don't let your own personal like negative thoughts on something uh, inhibit you from, from being um, one of those early adopters. I actually think in, in this situation, being an early adopter is, is a good thing. I absolutely agree with you on that. And also in regards to the societies and organizations that you've been a president on and involved with, are there any um, subspecialties within there that the residents and fellows can get involved with? Are there actual um, training for them? Is like a business one-on-one class for them? How, how are you guys giving back to the next generation of surgeons? You know something, that is a great question. That is something that is absolutely needed. Um, I think that there's a lot of training that uh, would benefit people in leadership. Uh, one of the things that I would recommend for any person that's going into a job or want to getting involved in society is learning a little bit about leadership. That's something that no one teaches you uh, in your training. And, and there are people that are natural leaders and they adopt principles of leadership just by, by secondhand nature. There are a lot of people that could really improve their leadership skills just by taking some educational courses, reading some books, and really having some type of mentor. Um, I, I've actually done a lot of the leadership training, and when I give these little tiny bits and pieces to the residents and fellows, they, they love it. And, and sometimes I see them repeating one thing that I've said, and they said they stick with it, and it's really helped them when they deal with other consults. They deal with other people that are maybe above them, or when they're dealing with their partners, or when they're looking for jobs. I think leadership is something that we really need to teach these people. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Interview with the Surgeon. Until next time, stay focused and keep following your dreams.